One of the things I noticed recently while making the hydrogen video is that the number E appears in every part of the energy eigenstate. So it appears in the radial parts, it appears in the spherical harmonics, it appears in the time evolution of the atom. And while I've always appreciated E from a mathematical perspective, because it's central to so many things in math, uh, normal distributions, compound interest, and so on, seeing how prominent of a role that it has in the smallest atom in the universe made me appreciate that it's really a fundamental number in nature, in physics. Of course, in many ways, not just with the atom. You also have radioactive decay and waves in general. I mean, E appears all over the place. Anyway, a lot of people don't know why E has the value it has. Why is E 2.71828? So I just wanted to make a quick video where I'm going to show you how to calculate this. And it's a really nifty calculation. It feels like a magic trick. So let's dive right into it. So we have to ask the question, why is it that E appears all over the place to begin with? And the reason is that the defining feature of E is that the function E to the X is equal to its own derivative. That is, the more you have of the function, the faster the rate of change. And when you're solving differential equations, you can imagine that very often you're going to run into a situation where you have a derivative equaling or being proportional to the function. If you go back to hydrogen part 2 and look at the way we solve the Schrodinger equation, you'll see how the uh, azimuthal component pops out with the e to the im phi, and so that's an example of e coming out of a differential equation. So anyway, let me propose to you the following math problem. Given that the function e to the x is equal to its own derivative, solve for e. Now at first glance, you might look at this and say, wait a minute, is this enough information? How do we get a number out of this? It's all just letters and things. So the first thing we want to do is we want to expand e to the x as a Maclaurin series. Or another way of putting it is we're going to say this function can be written as the polynomial where you have potentially infinitely many terms. And we can write that by saying it's a0 plus a1x plus a2x squared plus a3x cubed plus dot 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 plus a n x n plus dot 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 all the way out to however many we need, maybe infinity. And so this is just the most vague and general way of writing a polynomial. But now the problem is we don't actually know what any of these coefficients are, and so we haven't actually said anything, really. So how can we get any information out of this? It doesn't seem like we should be able to, right? But wait a minute. Set x equal to 0 and look what happens. All of those x terms get annihilated, and we end up with e to the 0 equals a0. So okay, a0 is e to the 0. And we know e to the 0 is 1 even if we don't know e. Now let's go back to the Maclaurin series, and we can see that e to the x can be written as 1 plus a sub 1x plus a sub 2x squared plus a sub 3x cubed plus dot 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 plus so on and so on. Now here's where the derivative comes into play. So looking at this expression for e to the x, we can go ahead and take the derivative. When you take the derivative of 1, that becomes 0, that just goes away. Take the derivative of a1x, and you end up with a1. Take the derivative of a2x squared, and you end up with 2a2x, right? These are polynomial derivatives. Take the derivative of a3x cubed, and you get 3a3x squared. Take the derivative of a n x to the nth power, and you end up with n a n x to the n minus 1th power. Okay, now this part feels like magic. So in order for e to the x to equal its own derivative for all values of x, these two polynomials have to be equal in each order. So the term that has no x dependence has to be equal in both the equations. If you look at e to the x, we have the factor of 1. And if you look at the derivative of e to the x, you have that the constant term is a sub 1. But if those are equal, then now we know that a sub 1 equals 1. But now returning to the e to the x equation, if we plug in 1 for a1, and then we go back to the derivative equation, then we see that 1 equals 2a2, in other words, a2 is 1 half. And then we put 1 half up in the first equation, and we see that now a2 is 1 half, so 1 half x squared has to equal the 3a3 x squared from the derivative equation. But now we know that 1 half is 3a3, and so in other words, a3 is 1 sixth. And then we put 1 sixth in the top equation, and that equals 4a4 in the bottom equation, and the whole thing zips all the way out to infinity. And what we end up with is a formula for all of these coefficients, which is just that a n, the nth order coefficient, is 1 over n factorial. And so therefore, we can write e to the x as the sum of x to the nth power divided by n factorial, where n is an integer that runs from 0 all the way up to infinity. And by the way, remember that for whatever reason, 0 factorial equals 1, okay? So, we're almost there. How do we solve for e? Easy. Set x equal 1. Because then we have e to the 1 equals 1 plus 1 plus 1 half plus 1 sixth plus 1 24th plus so on and so on and so on. <laughs> And don't just take my word for this, but get out a calculator and take a look at it, and you can see how quickly the series converges towards this value of 2.71828 and so on. And so that is why E is E.